with Second. Um, so we're going to be over the next two months looking at the letter of Second Peter. Um, if you've not been with us, or maybe you're new here, I don't know if we got some new folks. Um, we expository preach. We go through books of the Bible, and today we're in Second Peter. Um, I I'm going to spend some time today laying out the letter. Um, as many of you know, have been around since we do books of the Bible often. Um, getting a grasp of the culture, of the setting, of the letter is really important in bringing application to our lives today. You've got to know what the intent of the writer was, the culture he was writing to, what they who are receiving the letter would, would be understanding of what the apostle wrote, and then we can look at today's culture and do the, you know, from then until now application. Today, I will say, will be more about relevancy and more of historical setting Bear with me. Hopefully you, hopefully you like history. If you don't, I'm sorry. But we're going to look at some history and some applic- um, relevancy to this letter to our lives. Okay? Now look with me. According to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, we find that this letter, 2 Peter, is really the second letter to the recipients. Chapter 3, verse 1, he writes, This is now the second letter. We already went through 1 Peter. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. So now he's writing his second letter. The situation of the recipients of 2 Peter find themselves in a similar but worse condition that was written, uh, that they found themselves when the letter of 1 Peter was written. If you remember, both letters are written to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, to a persecuted church. When Peter wrote 1 Peter, it was early 60s A.D. Nero was the emperor, and there was persecution, and Christians were suffering for their faith. 62, 63, he writes 1 Peter. It was on the eve of an outbreak that would take place around 64 A.D. when a fire breaks out in Rome, Uh, set up by Nero, many people believe that he actually lit the fire himself to burn part of Rome down so he could build himself a better city, and then he blames Christians. After he blames Christians, he has a a fierce persecution rises up against Christians. They start, you know, um, impaling Christians, lighting them on fire, skinning them alive, wrapping skins of, of animals, and throwing them into lion's dens. I mean, just crazy persecution has taken place. And 2 Peter was written under those conditions, okay? So 1 Peter is written early 60s on the, on the break of this persecution, but not quite there yet. 64, 65 AD, persecution breaks out, and now Peter's writing his second letter around 66 to 67 AD. It depends on who you read, okay? So Peter's writing this actually right before he dies. He talks about that in this letter. He knows his, his, his life is coming to an end. Both the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul get martyred by Nero. So Nero's not a happy camper, okay? And Peter's under these conditions in Rome. Persecution has broken out. Just people are getting murdered everywhere. It's after the fire. And Peter then writes this letter to the churches. Okay, follow me? Second letter. Now, 1 Peter is a pastoral letter. It's a letter of encouragement. We talked about that. We said Peter's writing to encourage them in their suffering and in their persecution to keep their eyes on Jesus, to recognize that this home, that this is not our final destiny, that someday we'll have a redeemed earth, a redeemed planet, and redeemed bodies, that we will live together with Jesus, that we are to grow in our faith. We're to be separated from sin, devoted to God. We are to live a life that brings glory to God, showing the world, his beauty, his glory, and his infinite value. It was a message of hope. That's First Peter. Second Peter is a message of warning. Totally different tone. It's more polemic than it is pastoral. It's more about argument and, 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 and controversies and, and Peter pointing out false teachings. Some have said that First Peter and Second Peter are so different that Peter didn't write the letter. And I just mentioned this because you might have that in your study Bibles. That Peter didn't write the letter. And that, that somebody else wrote it maybe a century or two later, what they call synonymous, meaning that somebody else wrote the letter and put the apostle's name on it. Maybe somebody that was trained under Peter, but a century or so later, that the book really wasn't written by him because it's so different in content. It's so different in literary style. Okay? That's what some would say. 
Chapter 2, verse 1 settles it for me. Simeon, Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. That settles it for me. Right? I mean, if the letter was written by somebody else a century later and they put Peter's name on it, I don't know about you, but that's deceptive. That's dishonest. It doesn't belong in Scripture. Peter wrote the letter of 2 Peter, and we are to stand on that authority. It's part of our, what we called canon. Canon means rule or standard. The canon of Scripture, that by which we say belongs under the authority uh, of God, that God's word is authoritative in the canon, in the 66 books of Scripture. Second Peter was the last one to be put in the canon, but it is part of our canon. I believe, and I'll stand with the apostle, that he actually wrote the letter. Now, the differences in literary style and the difference of mood could be, and I believe, for at least two good reasons. Number one, uh, Brother Ricky mentioned last week that there could be what was used in that day, what's called amanuens, which means it's a secretary. So if, if I'm dictating a letter to somebody, and, and I dictate letters sometimes, and Annis will come in and we'll, we'll talk and I'll dictate something to her, and she'll be like, ah, you know, that's, maybe she'll word that differently, and I'll, I'll do that because she's smarter than I am, okay? So this can take on a different flavor, that maybe there was a different secretary, uh, Sylvanus, we mentioned last week, Silas might have been the, the one that wrote 1 Peter. Maybe somebody else wrote 2 Peter, gave it a different flavor while Peter was dictating all the word of God. I'm not taking away from that. But I think the reason that 1 Peter and 2 Peter is so different in literary style and, 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 and content is because of its purpose. Because of its purpose. When you write a letter or an email to somebody and all you want to do is just shoot them up with a big dose of encouragement, love, and hope, it's going to look very different when you send the same, a different email to the same person with the purpose of caution and warning and a deep concern that they're being led astray by a lie. Different. Same person, same recipients, but different tone, different flavor, different ways in which we say things. That's exactly what Second Peter is all about. False teachers have arisen in the churches in Asia Minor, in that area of Turkey, have risen and they're perverting the gospel. Paul says in, in Galatia, someone preaches another gospel, let him be anathema, let him be condemned. So Peter knows that there are false teachers that are rising in this, in this area as persecution is being broken out. It, it gives open door to perverted teaching, perverting the gospel, distorting the scriptures downplaying the coming of Jesus Christ and the eternal judgment that he will bring. And these false teachers were seeking to seduce Christians in these churches that Peter loved to, to join them in their folly and in their sin and in their lust and self-indulgences. Peter tells us that, and we'll see this in the book, that we are to overcome these false teachers and their errors by standing firm firmly on the knowledge of God's indisputable and assured word and promises. To know God. The word know, you can mark that in your Bibles, the word know is used at least nine times. To know or knowledge nine times in this very short epistle. And when Peter talks about knowledge, and we're going to look at this as we get into the book, nine times it's mentioned, he's not just talking about mere intellectual cognitive knowledge, although he is, but he's talking about the knowledge of, 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 of living, of, of participating in the truth, but walking in it, experiencing it, right? Experiencing a relationship, an intimate relationship with our creator through the abiding work of Christ. It, it's, it's what we would call the mystical or existential aspect of our faith. When I use that word mystical, I'm not talking about throwing away objective truth and solely relying on experience, but, but I am referring to that deep experience, that, that compelling sense of union with Christ, dwelling within us, the knowledge of God, a divine reality that's been given to us through the work of his spirit living in our lives. Yet God reveals himself in his word, we'll look at that, but that faith part, that walking, that sensing, that intimacy, that, that experiential knowledge of our faith. And Peter, in this letter, is going to be talking about both. We'll see that even today. P 
Peter's warnings against false teaching shouldn't surprise us. Jesus warned about false teachings, didn't he? He came, back, he, he came against the religious leaders of that day and their false doctrines. And then he said in Matthew 7 and 23 and 24 that there will be false prophets who will come up among you in the church, outside the church, to lead people astray. So let, let me just sum up the, the theme of the book as we, as we look. First, the theme of the book first is Peter writes the letter to establish, to strengthen, to affirm Christians in their true knowledge of God. Like 1 Peter, what you will notice, 2 Peter opens up with the reality of our salvation made possible in Jesus Christ. He does the same thing in 1 Peter as he does in 2 Peter. And then through that, which we saw in 1 Peter, we'll see again today, through that knowledge that Jesus is our salvation, that we are to then grow and we are to then be sanctified, which means to be more like Jesus, to grow spiritually in our walk. And that Peter will say that our, our reliability and the authority upon the scriptures. So there's truth in, in objective truth in scripture. There's a subject of truth, the reality that we are to walk in union with Christ. And he'll say that in the beginning of his letter. Second, not only to, first is a, uh, to establish and strengthen Christians in the knowledge of God, Paul, Peter, secondly, says in this letter, one of the themes is that we need to be careful of false teachers. Folks, there are false teaching all around us. You know, we hear the word about being intolerant, and people just throw that word around, and, and they have no context of it, and they don't even tell you what context they mean it in. There are false teachers in our day that are trying to teach you the false things about God. And, and Peter as he sees his death drawing near, wants to warn us of these false teachers seeking to turn men and women from their faith, and he assures us that God is able, chapter 2, to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. No matter what they say, they're not going to escape judgment. And God will keep you. If you keep strong in him, if you keep looking to him, he will keep you, 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 2. One of the things that we will see also in this letter is those who believe lies live in a lie. Peter will say the lies and the deception and the false teaching has caused Christians to live a lifestyle contrary to his word. They live in, 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 in lust, he says, into sensuality. He says, but you, he ends the book with, you look to Jesus you know that the end times will come. Judgment will come. He talks a lot about that. And you are to continue to look to Jesus, he says at the end of the book, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord. True knowledge, growing in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord. Now, family, listen. This is so relevant for today. This is so relevant. This week, I was just... I just kept, I, I tried to get into the text deeper and deeper, and all I kept doing as God was working on my heart is to say, step back, step back, step back. We are in what is called a postmodern era, right? Very generally, moder modernity or the modern age was a time where objective truth came through rational thought, the human reasoning. Modern science rejected God because the, the source of truth that came through scientific methods took its place. And modernity, a time that, was, that I think is now on its way out, but modernity attempted to establish truth on the basis of scientific accuracy through the processes of human reasoning. So what, what we had years ago, and, and I, I came through that, I'm a little bit older than some of you here, is that what you can see, what you can prove, rational thought, rational reasoning was truth. Anything outside of that that can't be proven is no longer true. So therefore, the knowledge of God, who is above creation, we don't really know. Because human reasoning take its place. That was modern times, or what the modern era. Today, we live in a postmodern culture. And again, just very generally, postmodernity and, 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 and even Christians' understanding of truth is in question. Because now we're being taught that truth is not universal, it's not objective, it's not absolute, and cannot be determined by common accepted methods. Instead, postmodernists argue that truth is socially constructed. You see that? 
It's not objective anymore. It's what you say it is. It's plural. It's multiple truths. Your truth is different than my truth. Richard Rorty, he's a postmodern philosopher, said this, truth is made rather than found. Truth is made rather than found. Michael um, Falkutz, he's another prominent postmodern theorist, he says, all claims to truth are construed or are constructed to serve those in power. So you see there's a, there, there's a, there's a culture that wants to deconstruct there's a culture that wants to say there are no absolute truths. In fact, if there is absolute truth or you claim to have absolute truth, you're only doing it because you want to remain in power. You want to remain in power. So what happens? You see it in our, in our culture. There's no absolute truth. There's no absolute authority. If there's no absolute authority, rebel against the government. Rebel against your boss. Rebel against... You know, uh, um, churches, community leaders, teachers, parents. There's no ultimate truth. There's no way to know it. There's no authority in my life. All truth is under attack. That's the culture in which we live in. You can't know truth. You can't know truth. And of course, you know, they say, well, if you say you do, if you say, no, there is absolute truth in the world, they'll say, oh, what, you're just doing that to try to, contrive and try to control people and of course the postmodern people are doing the same thing and they wield their power in the name of the oppressed people everywhere right the claim that you cannot know objective truth is an objective truth statement right you can't know that really yes you can know that you're, you're being absolute and you can't know that no you're being absolute saying you can't so they're both objective truth claims and we live in a culture, so, so as we live in an era, an increasing culture where truth is no longer absolute, but it's just subjective to one's own interpretation, where people are saying truth is relative, your truth is not any truer than my truth, we need to stand firmly and grounded in something or someone that can be trusted. That's what was going on in Second Peter. They didn't have, they were, they were, the, the false teachers were coming against the knowledge of God. Now, now, family, when I say the knowledge of God, understand the primary source of the knowledge of God is not speculation, contemplation, but revelation. The word revelation means the unveiling. Human reasoning or the human attempt to comprehend or to know God is speculation. Revelation is God unveiling and revealing and giving to us who he is. We would never, ever know God, know his character, know what he expects of us. We would not know him unless he was and he has made himself known. Left to yourself, the only God that you will create is the one in your own mind. <laughs> That's scary. Even if it was in me, I'm not pointing fingers. Okay, but God has given us his revelation in his word so that we can know him. He has done it through dreams. He has he's done it through visions. He has done it as he came down and spoke to Moses, direct revelation. Hebrews chapter 1 says this is what he has done in the final days. Hebrews 1 it says long ago at many times in many ways, that's the different ways God has spoken. He spoke to our forefathers by the prophet. But in these last days, which he means now, he has spoken to us by his son. God is not known by human instrument or human ability. God is known through self-disclosure. And the reason that's so important as we move forward in this book, particularly in your life today, folks, especially young folks, high school, college age, that's your culture. You can't know truth. Don't come in here with absolute truth. Don't tell me you're right and I'm wrong. Don't tell me that you know and I don't know. Don't tell me that you have a standard of what is right and what is wrong. Don't tell me that God has said this is the way we should live and this is the way we should live. Saw it on ESPN this week. Don't tell us that. It's an attack against your faith. They are just as much telling you what absolute truth is as you standing on the word of God. Number two, why this is so important today. Gospel-centered people living on mission, that's who we are as King's Chapel, gospel-centered people living on mission, sharing our faith with people around us, 
we must get into and understand culture. It's called cult, uh, contextualizing the culture. I'm going to put in a shameless plug for Gospel 301. We're going to talk about that. So you need to be there. What does it mean to contextualize culture, to engage it for the cause and the glory and the mission of Jesus? We have to understand who we're talking to. You talk about absolute truth and it goes right over people's heads. There is none. So you, sometimes you just have to step back for a minute and say, okay, how can I engage this one for the cause of the gospel? So my prayer as we move through this letter, that, that you know, this awesome letter, that truth changes us. We can't change the truth. Truth changes us. We can't change truth. Truth changes us. And God, through this awesome letter of Peter, wants our hearts and our lives to be solidly stable and resting on the gospel, the precious promises of God. There's a war going on. It was going on in the day of 2 Peter. It is going on in Glenmont 2013, wherever community you live in, on the true knowledge of God. And we have to be firm in where we're standing and placing our feet solidly upon him who is true. Now, we're going to look at our text. We're not going to get through this. I'm going to tell you right now, we're really going to do number one. That's it. We're going to get through verses one and two. Um, I just want to do a long introduction. We'll look at one and two next week. Um, we'll do a little of three, but we definitely won't get to four, uh, verse four. Um, we'll end in verse three. So we're going to look at this text through three teachings or three headings. The pardon, verse one and two. The power, verse three. And the promises, verse four. So we're going to deal really with uh, just one. Okay? So if you're wondering. Look with me the pardon of God. Again, just like First Peter, Peter begins his book as they did in ancient times. He starts with the, the one who's writing the letter. Unlike you and I today, we write a letter, dear so-and-so, we write all the letter and we put our name at the bottom. So the person has to open the letter and look right to the bottom to see. Not in that day, a little smarter, I think. They write, this is who I am, I'm writing the letter, then he'll name who the recipients are. And he opens up, Simeon, this is who's writing the letter, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Right? The, the author is introduced in a very unique way in 2 Peter, unlike any other letter, I believe. Two names, two titles. Look what he says. Simeon, Peter. Okay, Simeon is the Greek translation of his Hebrew name, which, uh, which is Simon or Simeon. And Peter comes from Petros, which is the Greek translation of the Aramaic name Cephas, which is Peter. Now, where did Peter get his name from Simeon to Peter? Jesus, John chapter 1, verse 42. Andrew, grabbed, which is Peter's brother, grabs Peter and says, come on out. You got to see this, man. We found the Messiah. He brings him to Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Peter, or Cephas in Aramaic. You shall be called Cephas. Then we know in Matthew 16, Jesus says to his disciple, who do you think I am? Simon Peter replied, both names, Simon Peter. He says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of Jonah. That was his father's name. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So he needed revelation too. Peter, go figure that out, who I am. No, 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 everybody else got it wrong, and so would have you, Peter. But my father opened up your brain and revealed to you who I was, because flesh and blood didn't do it. My father gave that to you. Talk about revelation. Verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus is recognizing, Peter is recognizing in the opening of this letter, his birth name and his new birth name. Who he was before he met Jesus, and who he'd become after he met Jesus. Now we know that Peter is not the rock that the church is being built upon. He already said so in 1 Peter 2. You can look at it, he calls Jesus the rock of offense, the cornerstone. It's the confession of Peter. But Peter opens this letter letting people know, listen, this is who I was, and oh my, this is who I am because of the grace of God. I am Simon, that's my birth name, but I am Peter because Jesus changed my life. That's where some of you have been too, and that's where I've been. This is who I was. And then I met Jesus, and his love, and his grace, and his mercy, and his goodness changed me. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm not perfectly changed. I'll see that place in glory. But I'm not the man. I'm not the woman I used to be. Any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. And Peter's pointing to his, his that, you know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm Simon, but I'm Peter. That's the whole man. I got a track record. I got a real history. But this is what God has done in my life. I know who I was, but I know by the grace of God who I am. My life has been forever changed. My life has been forever changed. We need to hear that. Paul, excuse me, Peter uses both to, to, to indicate all that God has done in his life. Then he goes on, not only uses his name, but he says, I'm a servant and an apostle. I'm a servant, I'm a doulos, I'm a bond slave of Christ. I don't belong to myself, I belong to Jesus. I am now his servant and I am an apostle. See the balance? Peter wants to say I'm a servant because he wants to say I have humbled myself, I have led, I have, I have served the church. I'm sacrificing for the church, but I'm an apostle. So when I write about those false teachers, pay attention. I walked with Jesus. I was an eyewitness of his ministry. In fact, during my daily morning devotions, if I had a question, I asked Jesus. How cool is that? You're like, hmm, what does that mean? Uh, Jesus, can you explain this to me? Can you imagine? I know, we're all thinking, you know what, I would argue with him. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think that's what it means. Oh, no, no, that's what it means. See, back here, no, I don't know. You know what, let me go ask, let me ask one of the other disciples. You know what I mean? And Jesus would be like, oh, there he goes again. You know, that would have been me. That would have been Peter, too, arguing with Jesus. Oh, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah, Peter, I'm God, uh, and I know. <laughs> all right? But he wants to show the readers that in the end, he both served and led the church in truth and humility, humble and authoritative. What a, what a great balance. What a great balance. And he goes on to say, to those, that's who he's writing to, those churches, to the, those Christians, to those who have obtained the faith, I love this, of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Some of you in your NIV has precious as ours. King James has like precious faith. It's because the Greek term, um, esodomos, means, esa means equal and like, tomos means value, precious and co costly. So like ours, that is a costly and precious faith. And, and, and this, 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 you know, unmeasurable faith that's been given to us. And what Peter is saying, there's not this special faith that, that apostles get. And then there's this special faith or, or this, this lower faith than everybody else gets. He says, equal faith. Equal faith. Yes, he's an apostle. Yes, he has authority. But he recognized like everyone else, he comes to faith and trusts in Jesus the same way it's by grace. And what's the basis of his faith? Look what he says. Underline this in your Bible, folks. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. See what he says? We obtain an equal faith. We come the same way. I'm not special in that sense. I'm authoritative, but I'm not special. We have an equal faith by the righteousness of God. That's really important. That is really important. It is the gospel of the righteousness of Christ that is our source of righteousness. It is not our own. The word righteousness has to do with conforming to a standard, a, 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 a perfection, a righteousness, to do what's right in the eyes of God. The Bible says, be perfect as I am perfect. So that has, has to do with, with, with conforming to a standard. But the same word has to do with being in a law court. And we get the word justified, or the Bible uses the word justified, depending on your translations. It's a legal term. It comes from the realm of law courts. It's the doctrine, or it's the understanding, it's the teaching concerning the way in which a man may attain a state approved of God, accepted by God. He's perfect, I am not. So we talk about justification and righteousness. We talk about how does a sinner who's separated from God because of sin, because of re rebellion, he's a holy God, his his standard is perfection, we got a problem. We got a problem. There's separation there. I'm a sinner. He's perfect. He expects perfection. I've rebelled against him. We have a problem. That's the idea, and that's the deal with justification, okay? Because all of us are sinners. All of us are guilty of judgment and damnation, and in and of ourselves, we have no righteousness. In fact, the Bible says that our righteousness is but filthy rags before him. Is but filthy rags before him. Okay? 
The Bible tells us that we cannot obtain our own righteousness. We cannot do it. And our ability, therefore, to stand before a holy God, now, as, as we come to him in prayer, as we fellowship with him, as we come to know him, as Peter's talking about, our ability to do that, to stand before him in now and in eternity as rescued and redeemed persons depends entirely on, listen, the righteousness of Jesus Christ because we don't have any. Jesus alone walked this earth without sinning. He alone can make atonement for our sins. He alone can justify the ungodly. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. For the by works of the law, by your, good, by your deeds, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Since therefore the law comes, knowledge of sin. Don't do that, we do it. Right, don't we? Can I get an amen? Or is there anybody perfect here? Okay, all right, so through the law comes the knowledge of sin, but, he says, the, Paul writing, the righteousness of God has been made known or manifested Apart from the law, because we could never do it, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, they spoke about Jesus. It's the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Through the work of redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation, that is a, a wrath bearer, a bearer of God's wrath, by his blood to be received by faith, so that he, God, might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You hear what he's saying? He's saying God is just, we are sinners. God bore our sin and redeemed us on the cross so that he could be just Sins paid for, and the justifier giving us forgiveness. Some people think that God just, oh, you know, he forgives our sins as if that's just something he, his nature, you know, he's just a forgiving God. Let me tell you, God cannot forgive sin as if he is just saying it's, it's okay. God forgives sin because Jesus bore our sin. And every sin will be paid for, either by Jesus or by the individual who rejects Jesus in eternity and damnation. Sin will be paid for. God forgives our sins because of the righteousness and the justification of Jesus. He dies as our sin bearer, bearing the wrath against sin because God is holy and he does not embrace, will not embrace, will not accept sin in his presence. He's a holy and just God. And I will tell you, every religion around the world will tell you something completely opposite. That you earn your righteousness. That you, that you can be righteous. That you can grant yourself salvation by your moral goodness. Whether it's the five pillars, whether it's visiting Mecca, whatever it is. Even Christians. Christians get caught up in that religious belief that, you know what? I am going to just obey God. I'm going to do what he tells me. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do all those things. And when I do all those things, God will now love me and accept me and, and bring me into heaven. That's religion. The gospel says that Jesus Christ in his moral perfect record died for me, rose for me, and because he loves me, I will obey him. Because he died for me, I will obey him. Because he loved me and accepted me because of the cross, I will now respond in that grace, in that mercy, through an obedient life. You see, to obey, to be accepted is religion. Being accepted and obedience is the gospel. So there's a big difference between the two. In fact, the Bible says when we bring our, you know, look how good we are, Lord. Isaiah says it's filthy rags. Menstrual rags, really, if you want to get down to the Hebrew. Paul tells us in Philippians that it's a pile of, for you King James folks, dung. Poop. So we can't come to God and say, look at all the good things we had. He's not impressed. He's not impressed. He knows our actions, and he knows that we need righteousness, but it's not coming from us. 2 Corinthians 5, God made him, that's Jesus, who know no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. John Stott, if you're, any of you got some reading you want to do, some reading over the summer, it's a great book, 
from John Stott called The Cross of Christ. I highly recommend this book. This is what he says about justification. When God justifies sinners, he is not declaring bad people to be good or saying that they are not sinners after all. He is pronouncing them legally righteous, free from any liability to the broken law because he himself in his son has borne the penalty of their law breaking. Family, the most important thing that we need before a holy God is to be forgiven, to be pardoned, to be made with God, to be made right with God, to be declared not guilty before the judge of the world. How does it happen? Jesus' is perfect life. He fulfilled the law. He died an atoning death so that we can be acquitted and forgiven of our sins. And when you believe that, folks, when you turn from your sins and you cling to Jesus, if you hold to what, he's, what he has done for you, when you place your confidence in Christ alone and his righteousness, that's when uh, the reformers would say, that's when the great exchange takes place. In Latin, the, the simul justa peccator, the well, simultaneously righteous because of the imputation or the reckoning of Christ's righteousness, and, and, and we are yet still know that we have sinned against God. Right? Latin peccator means, means sinner. So we are simultaneously righteous before God because of the righteousness of Christ, but we know that we still sin against God. But the great exchange takes place that our filthy rags, our sinfulness, our rebellion has been placed on Jesus. His righteousness has been placed on us. The great exchange. The great exchange. R.C. Sproul says it this way. In a legal and positional case, we are righteous once we are justified because when God looks at us, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. Folks, let that sink in. But this righteousness is not something that we have within ourselves. It's something we can do. It is declared righteousness. We are no longer legally subject to the punishment due our sin. Nonetheless, sin is still present in us until we are glorified. God can view us as righteous in Christ because of imputation, because of his credited to us. That is, the perfect righteousness earned by Jesus is imputed to us. In turn, he says, our sins are imputed to Jesus, who made satisfaction for them on the cross by bearing the wrath of God against his people on the cross. So we, you have to see this. Peter is saying from the get-go that the righteousness that we have obtained is not our own. The gospel is that the righteousness of Christ has been given to those who believe, who have trusted not in themselves, but trusted in, some, in someone else, which is Jesus Christ, our God. And just for a mental note, I didn't want to just pass this before we move on. In your, in your Bible, in 2 Peter, one of, the, one of the ways in which false teaching has been brought into our culture, in our, some of our circles, is to devalue or to to say that Jesus Christ is not God. God, the eternal, everlasting God, become man in the incarnation. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is what we believe. But there are some who lie and don't teach that truth to their damnation, uh, whether it be Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormon Church. I will tell you in verse 2, and I just want to point this out, that when it says God and Savior Jesus Christ, you couldn't get any more clear in the Greek. Peter writes that God and Savior, there is one, uh, um, one uh, I think it's, a, um, let me see, okay, there is one, I think it's definite, yeah, one definite article governing both nouns. Peter is putting together God Almighty and Savior Jesus Christ as one person. You can't get any more clear than that. So when they come knocking at your door, take out First Peter 1 and say, nope, right here, God and Savior. He's, he's our God, and he's the Savior. It says it right there. And that's so important. That's so important in combating false teaching and, and stuff that is going around today. And then he says, because of that knowledge, of course of knowing that your righteousness is in Christ, that our God and Savior died for us, he says you can have grace and peace may be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Cause and effect. If you, if you, if you have knowledge, true knowledge of God, that you understand that the righteousness is Christ that's been given to you, then there is grace, peace in your life. 
Romans 5, 1 says, we have been justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's this knowledge that we have that moves forward to the grace and peace in our life, all right? All right, let's move on to point two. I just got a couple things, and then we'll close. We'll come to communion. The power of God. Paul is not, excuse me, Peter is not changing subject here. Righteousness given to us in Christ, grace and peace multiplied to you in the knowledge, both objective and subjective knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. And then he says, and because of that or, or in that, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Life and godliness. Our pardon, our forgiveness for his glory and our power to grow, to, to, to live a life that is pleasing to God. And Peter is, is, is combating the false teaching of that day, and we hear it, I hear it today as well, of antinomianism, which means Christ has done this work for me on the cross, and therefore I can live any way I want. So you're telling me, uh, Pastor, that the righteousness of Christ has been given to me, reckoned to me, imputed to me, and, and, I, and, and therefore it's not what I do, it's what Jesus did, so I can go and do whatever I want. Peter's like, no. No, that's not what I'm saying, Peter's saying. No, that's not it. In fact, his divine power in you has given everything you need to live a life, this life and a life of godliness. Talk about a counterculture message. Pull up yourself by your bootstrap. You could do it. You got the power with, no, you don't. You got to rely upon the grace of God. Spiritual maturity begins with God's provision. And, and how important is that today? In 2 Peter 1, 2, 3, see that little word life? All things that pertain to life and godliness. That means all of life. That means just living life out. And even though we live in a postmodern culture, even though there are no absolute truth, you know that your friends, your family, your neighbors, your parents, you know, the people you come in contact with have questions about life. They're looking for absolutes. They're looking to place their feet on something, especially when things happen in their life that they have no control over. You know, why am I here? Questions of the heart. What, what, why, why am I here? What, what is going on in my life? Why am I in such pain? Why do these things happen? All these questions are interpretation. All these questions get answered by our interpretation of life. A life outside of the knowledge of God and something that God has revealed to us produce in us questions that can't be answered or questions once we answer those questions outside of God begin to crack when things happen in our lives. You see that all around us. All of a sudden, oh, no, I can interpret life. This is what I need for life. And all of a sudden, my portfolio falls. All of a sudden, my spouse leaves. All of a sudden, my home is no longer. All of a sudden, my kids are, that I, you know, I need them to justify myself, are no longer walking with the Lord, are rebelling. And all of a sudden, life, although we had it all interpreted, we know what we need, comes crumbling down around us. What Peter is saying is that God has given us what we need. God has given us what we need through the knowledge of him, not something we get in ourselves. Let me put one more plug in to another great book. I know you guys want to do a lot of reading this summer. The Cross of Christ, John Stott, and another great book is J.I. Packer. Many of you read this book, Knowing God. Great book, great book. Listen to what he says about knowing God. In the book, Knowing God, he says, What were we made for? To know God. What aim should we set ourselves in life? To know God. What is the eternal life that Jesus gives us? Knowledge of God, John 17. This is life eternal, that we may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. What is the best thing in life, bringing more joy, delight, and contentment than anything else? Knowledge of God. Jeremiah 9, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in wisdom, Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, God speaking. What of all the states God ever sees man in gives him most pleasure? Knowledge of himself. Hosea 6, I desire the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And then he writes, once you have become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, 
Most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord, end quote. Look what he says. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life, valuating life, understanding questions of life and godliness through, look what he says, the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and his excellence. It begins with the call of the gospel and the knowledge of God that our salvation is in Christ alone and then comes the power to live that life of holiness, of right living, of servanthood, of love, of faithfulness. You see that? I want you to see that. Let me illustrate it. Suppose, think, think for a minute. Suppose you're a prisoner of war. This is, uh, Piper does this illustration. Suppose you're a prisoner of war and you're in a concentration camp, he says, and you have lost all hope. You are hopeless, right? You're in a concentration camp. There is no hope. You're under severe persecution, lockdown, no hope. You are hopeless. And then you learn that there's going to be a prisoner exchange Right? They're planning a prisoner exchange. And you see the guard walking down the row, pointing to individual prisoners and calling them to follow him to their freedom. Their family awaits them. It is not, he says, a mere piece of knowledge when he points to you and calls you. He says, it's power. The power of hope surges through your body because you know that you've been called. So when Peter says that divine power for hope and godliness flows from the knowledge of our call to glory, we can feel what he means. If we could but see the glory and excellence of God and know that our creator has approached us and said, hey, you there, come. I'm going to show you my glory and give you an eternal life to enjoy. It means power. The power of hope and the power of godliness. You know this from experience, but when you see the glory and excellence of God most clearly and know he has set his affections on you, then is when you have the power to live as you ought. See what he's saying? When God calls us to his glory and excellence and clothes us in the righteousness of Christ, it is power. It is not I'm going to do what I want. It is I am going to submit and bow down to my king and my savior and to my God who did such great lengths to save me from myself. I will follow you. Think about this as we close. And think about this actually as you meet in community groups. I like to see the community groups uh, talk about this and think about this. Ideas, thoughts, and beliefs that you have. The way we think about God, the knowledge we have of God, both objective truth, which is scripture we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, and living life in obedience to his spirit. How does that affect the way you live? The answer is every way. What you think about God affects the way you live your life. People say, I don't want to know nothing about theology. Everyone has a theology. If you're here today and you don't even believe in God, that's your theology. If you believe that God is an angry God looking to beat you down every time you sin, that's your theology. If you believe that God's a genie in heaven every time I rub it and say, give me, he pops out and gives you what you need, that's your theology. If you believe that God's not in control and he's sleeping when bad things happen, that's your theology. But if you believe that God is eternal, loving, heavenly, beloved Father who is in control of the universe, who loves you deeply in Christ, that the gospel is the proof of his love, that we are so wicked he had to die, we are so loved he was glad to, and you look at life through all the lenses of the true knowledge of God, your life will reflect that truth. And if you don't, it'll reflect something else. Now talk about that this week. What am I believing? What am I knowing? What am I thinking about God? Is it affecting my life in negative in the positive is there things that i need to change and doctrines and things i need to believe so that when suffering comes so that when hardship comes so when things happen in life i'm able to see that through the knowledge of god through the scriptures of what the bible has revealed to him about himself okay talk about that this week now we're going to go to communion the band's coming up and i want to tell you This table, these cups, and this bread is a vivid reminder of the reality, the objective truth of Christ. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body that's been given to you. He literally did that. 
on the same night, he took the cup, the cup of wine, and said, this cup is poured out for you, and it's the new covenant in my blood. The juice represents that. Folks, that is objective truth that we could stand firmly on as we confess our sins, as we repent of our sins. May our hearts experience the weight of our sins lifted as we confess and repent of our sins, as Jesus comes to us in the power of his spirit. This table, this communion table, we pray, will be used of the Holy Spirit, symbolic message of Jesus, that he is our spiritual nourishment. He is the bread of life. And partaking of this communion table, may it strengthen our faith. May it confirm our faith. May it, may it help us to grow in our faith as God becomes accessible to us. Our faith, the human experience, our mystical union with Christ. May the Holy Spirit use the communion service to increase and strengthen and confirm us. Now, if you're new here, what we do is we play some music, confess our sins in our chairs, and quietly before God, and then we repent of our sins, which means turning from our sins. And then when you're ready, we come up and we celebrate the Lord's forgiveness. So if there's something in your heart, if there's something you've been holding back, I, I pray that the Spirit of God would, would invite you to confess and repent of your sins as we take communion together. It's not a King's Chapel table. If you're a Christian, you're welcome. If you're not a believer and you're here and you're just learning, just pray and sing, and we're just glad you're here and we could talk with you uh, at any time. Um, that you would like, even after the service. Let's pray together. Father, in the culture in which we live in, I don't think it's a whole lot different than so many other cultures, Lord. I certainly don't want to claim that. Father, we're thankful that you did not leave us to our own devices, our own interpretation, our own thinking, our own uh, uh, minds. But Lord, you revealed yourself to us in your word. Father, we pray that your spirit would draw us closer to you that we would not only know you objectively through your word, but we would sense your presence as we have this deep abiding union with Christ through the presence of your spirit. Father, we pray that today as we confess our sins, as we repent of our sins, Lord, we would celebrate the one true and living God who came to us in the person of Jesus, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death, and then rising three days later from the grave to forgive sin, to bestow mercy, to have grace on all those who will call on you. Father, thank you for the work that you're going to do as we sing and we worship and continue to worship you. In Jesus' good name, amen.